Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 34. We're getting up there. Yeah. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And that's it. Just me and you. Just us. Have we ever done a podcast with just us? Yeah. We've done a couple. Have we? I know we did the 80 to 100 was just us. That's true. And I think there's a couple others that we did, but usually... Usually Matt or someone else is here. I keep looking over here to see if Matt's here, but he's not. He's, he's in fact not sitting in the chair across from me. Yeah. Anyways, today we're going to be talking about an interesting, if nebulous, concept. Elegance. Your favorite type of concept. Yeah, I'm all about nebulous concepts. They're my favorite. This one's kind of weird, though, because I, I tried to define it, and I... I think I've gotten close to defining what I mean when I say that something is elegant in the concept of a game. So you have a nebulous definition of elegance? Yes. All right. F- fitting the concept. Before we get into that, though, I do want to lead off the podcast with a little announcement that I talked a little bit about last week, that I will be updating the Patreon for The Thoughtful Gamer, that I'm, if you are a regular listener of the podcast, you will know about. I will be updating the goals a little bit, and one of the most exciting ones is at $100 a month, which we're, we're pretty close to, actually. We're at about over $70 at this point. But if we can get up to $100 a month, I will start doing a quarterly game giveaway. And it won't be just any game that you know I get some publisher to donate. Rather, I will be hand-selecting some of my favorite games from that quarter that I've either played that quarter, played for the first time, are coming out soon depends on you know if i if i if i get a bunch of new games and i don't like any of them i'm not going to show them off to you guys i'll just pick some other games that i played that quarter that maybe have been around a while that i do enjoy a lot anyways at a hundred dollars will be a quarterly giveaway that everyone will be eligible for everyone who's part of the patreon so there'll be a full announcement of the changes to the patreon i think that's the most significant and exciting one so if you want to get in on that go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer and help us out that being said let's talk about some games and let's talk about elegance now i have no idea what you prepped for this podcast if anything i thought about it a little bit but i have not taken any notes and i don't have a ton of examples so we'll see cool well that's normal so that's that's how we usually do this kind of thing I wrote out some nebulous thoughts about 30 minutes ago, which is normal for me. So this should be a normal Thoughtful Gamer podcast. I'm really selling this thing. The subtitle of this podcast might be Nebulous Concepts or something. Yeah, maybe. Or (laughs) Nebulousception. I don't even know. I got in on a red-eye flight early, early this morning and then tried to sleep and kind of succeeded at that. I'm very tired today. So... The sub subtitle of this podcast might be Mark is very tired. <laughs> and the, the fourth subtitle is that this is the last podcast I will be on in person, at least for some time. Oh, yeah. So You're leaving. I, I'm traveling the world. The world. You're going to Scotland first, right? Yep. How long are you going to be there? About six weeks. Six weeks. And then you're coming back? I'll be here for a few days and then I have a few trips in the states and then i'll be probably back here sometime in september wait so where are you where are you going in between oh you're you're just going to scotland and then back and around the united states for about six weeks and then around the u.s i have uh, some things out in seattle and then i'm going to the grand canyon and then after that i'll probably be back here okay and then what's after that then you're going to sweden right after in october we're going various other places in europe and by we i mean me yeah um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sweden is on the list, Germany's on the list, Poland is on the list. Nice. Probably Italy, probably Iceland, probably So a France. bunch of a bunch of countries that are going to be very sad because of the World Cup. I guess France is still in France it. France is still in it. <laughs> Sweden is still in it. They play tomorrow. Oh, Sweden's still in it. Yep, they play Switzerland, I believe, tomorrow in a uh, matchup of underdogs, I suppose. Yeah, neither of those teams are particularly good, right? They're not known for being particularly good, no. Well, there you go. Well, one of them will be sad. One of them will be happy. That is true. By the time I go, all but one of them will be sad. <laughs> That's fair. But I mean, like, if Switzerland makes it to, like, the top four, I think they're going to be pretty pleased. Sure, sure. I mean, it's Switzerland. Yeah. Anyways, let's talk about elegance. 
I'm just going to throw it straight at you. What is when we're talking about elegance in the in the realm of board games? How would you define it? Making the complex simple. That's pretty good. If you're talking generally, if you ask someone what is elegance, they would their immediate instinct would be to go to the definition that's like synonymous with classy. That's definitely not what we're talking about. If right. you asked a physicist or a mathematician, they might get closer to what we're talking about with board games. And that's where I kind of started on this idea of elegance as an interesting concept when I was taking some math class in college and one of the professors got very excited about something in calculus. Isn't this, there like an equation in calculus that's like everything? Oh, maybe. I don't know. I don't um, know. It was, it was actually, like a fundamental equation or something. I have another example from calculus back in the day, actually, when my professor, he was teaching us how to integrate in a, a vector and from basic physics, we know that velocity is a vector because it has a, a direction and an amount. So sure. you're saying I'm going due west at 50 miles an hour. That would be a vector as opposed to I am traveling at 50 miles an hour without a direction. That would just be a scalar. Anyways, a vector, it can have multiple components. Maybe it's in 3D space, so there's three you know, X, Y, Z coordinates. But if you want to integrate a vector, you just integrate each element inside the vector and you get your integral. And he was like, it, it was just, it's written out to be a very simple thing when you write it out. And that was, he was like, look how elegant this is. This is amazing. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. I, I don't understand much of that, but I, I'm sure some of our audience will, will understand this. I failed calculus and dropped out <laughs> halfway through. So the, the mathematical concept that always comes to my mind when I think of elegance is Pythagorean's theorem. Sure. Because it's. It's something important. It explains something important because triangles are important. And it's it just looks stupidly simple. Yeah, it's, it's A it's squared, but B squared equals C squared. Usually complex idea or concept or topic or something and finding a way to express it very simply without extraneous complication getting in the way. And the part of the key, I think, is not losing the complexity of the thing you're talking about, mm -hmm. but finding a, a simple way of describing it or talking about it is the the challenge and doing that well is what makes something elegant. Yeah, but there's also this kind of aesthetic beauty of it. So like Pythagorean's theorem has A, B, C, and it has everything is squared. Like there's a symmetry it's, to it's it. It's very there's, symmetrical. It's yeah. almost musical, right? Sure. Whereas I was thinking, you know, Pi is something incredibly important in mathematics, and it's kind of a single number that does a whole lot. So you might say it's elegant, but it doesn't look elegant. Like, it's an irrational number. There's no symmetry to it. It's just kind of gangly. Is, yeah. is that something that's elegant, or does it lose? has it lost some of that beauty that would be required of it? I don't know. I think it kind of depends how you approach it. I can see how someone might say Pi is elegant because... You can apply it to any circle ever, and it's always, you know, sure. always the ratio of, you know, the, the diameter and the Ooh. words are escaping me right now. The circumference. Area, area and circumference, yeah. yeah. Although I think I did see once an argument all, by some there mathematician cool, that... like, infinite sums that you can, like, collapse down to be written fairly simply, and that will get you, um, as you go to infinity, they'll precisely give you pi. Interesting. Isn't there an argument among mathematicians over whether pi or is it tau, which is like the square root of pi, is is more mm, significant? I don't know. Uh, the the two most famous transcendental uh, irrational numbers in math are pi and e. Yeah. Um. Of course, which is like two point seven three. I forget what's the significance of e. Um. It's the log base. Um. It it shows up in a bunch of places. I forget. Okay. Where... It just kind of pops up. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably I'm probably missing something really important, but yeah, yeah. So I mean, f from this little thought experiment of comparing Pythagorean's theorem to pi, it occurred to me that it's not necessarily, at least in my mind, it's not necessarily something complex made simple, but it's also something complex made simple in a beautiful way. Sure. I think would be like maybe there's a case that pi is is 
an elegant concept, but I think it's an easier case to say that Pythagorean's theorem is an elegant concept. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that symmetry, the beauty, the... Maybe yeah. instead of pi, like, the golden ratio would be a more elegant sure. sort of concept. Yeah. yeah, that'd be something else that would that would manifest that. So in games, when we think of an elegant game, we think of something similar. We think of something simple that has complex strategy. Right, so a simple mechanism or decision point that has lots of thought and strategy and impacts and uh, yeah it's a very impactful and nuanced decision even though the actual choice is often very simple true so we may think of games that have a low rules overhead but have a lot of enjoyment out of them but i mean kind of the gold standard for elegance in gaming would be the abstract strategy games because they're not burdened down by theme and usually have a very simple rule set. So we look at games like Go and chess. Right. And maybe you say, okay, you, you compare the ratio of rules complexity or input complexity to output complexity, like the possibility space of moves, and maybe that's how you define the most elegant game. But I feel like maybe that's just my my propensity to, to complicate things but i feel like there's got to be a little bit more to that although it's hard to think of a more elegant game than go but for instance if go were developed and created over time over the centuries to not have the visuals that it's associated with usually a wooden board with the black and white pieces and maybe the the board was presented in a more ornamental way and the pieces were not just these little stones, we might not consider Go to be as complex or as, as elegant as we consider it now in relation to chess because it's often the line that people are like, oh, chess is such a complicated game. It's like, oh, it certainly is, but you know, Go is like the, the premier game of the ancient abstracts because it, it just has more... More, a larger possibility space. There are more possible moves in Go. And it's demonstrated by the fact that it took computers nearly 20 years longer to beat a, the best humans at Go than they did at chess. Right. Was it like 15? Actually, a little bit less than 15 years, right? Because Deep Blue was 94? Oh. Was it? I thought it was the, was the 80s. I thought it was 80s. Was it in the maybe, 80s? Maybe it was the... I thought it was late I 80s. always I forget. it was like 86 they played the first time. And then 87, they had a rematch, and Deep Blue won. Uh, 96, actually. Oh, 96? Yeah. Okay. So, actually, so, so about, about, 20 about, years, 20 years, yeah. about 20 Go, years later Go for Alpha Go. was about, what, two or three years ago? Yeah. Do you think that that's kind of the way to define it? That it's just simply the rules complexity versus the possibility space of the outcomes? I don't really think of elegance as something that I would measure. I just look at something and say, is this elegant? yes or no it's just something that i perceive in a game or a topic or something and i think it's something that you might not notice at first sometimes you have to appreciate the underlying medium or the things that they're not doing or the competitors maybe to say like oh wow this is this is really this is elegant because mm -hmm. look at the problem they solved and look how simple this is and how simple without losing complexity. I think the the game that most jumped out to me from modern board gaming would be Carcassonne. Yeah, I had uh, that on I my think, list yeah. actually, yeah. Um, but it comes down to just you draw a tile and you place a tile and that's your whole turn. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of thought and a lot of strategy and enough concepts to keep the game interesting and nuanced and challenging. Yeah, and I think I think some people fall into the trap. This is something I want to talk about later on, so but maybe I'll foreshadow it a bit. I think there might be a trap of saying that only very simple games can be elegant. So they, they mislabel simplicity as elegance. And while that's certainly a factor, if you compare Go, which has a very, very simple rule set, but is very elegant because it has a lot of strategy. And Bingo, which also has a very, very simple rule set, but has literally no strategy. Like, there's there's another factor in here. Mm -hmm. So maybe what I'm th what I'm getting at is... But there's not, it's, it's there's a, not the, complexity in Bingo. There's just random. There is none. Yeah. Right. So it's not elegant at all. Right. Although some people may argue that it is just because it's very simple. 
but it's not i mean technically it's not really a game it's a it's more of a gambling it's a, than yeah it's a gambling video. device it's a slot machine it's a black box right where you don't control the inputs <laughs> unless you're cheating but that's a whole nother story yeah i guess if you cheat at bingo it becomes a better game <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there an episode of Better Call Saul where he like puts magnetic paint on some of the the numbers? That and, sounds familiar. And they like gives the one lady the special scorecard that so she like makes sure she wins basically or something. Yeah, or you, or you think of the guys? Was it from MIT who created the algorithm for getting the edge in blackjack? That's much more elegant, though. There's right, but I'm saying like the game of doing that. I think it's a better game than just blackjack. (laughs) So I think there are three factors, right? There's the the relative simplicity of the rules compared to the relative complexity of the strategy. And then I think the aesthetic factor is important. Because again, we might not... If if the first Carcassonne that came out was the Star Wars Carcassonne, we we might not have the same feelings about it compared to its kind of quaint... French countryside aesthetic that we got with the original Carcassonne. If Go was much more ornament and, and you know had really complex figures traditionally rather than the stones, we might think of it as slightly less elegant as the Go we see today. So I think the aesthetic element is somewhat important, but it's hard to say how much how how important it is. I think that also varies a lot person to person. So for some people, a hugely ornamental game adds a lot of extra emotional impact or something to to seeing the different pieces or something like there's some really crazy chess sets out there yeah and then there are very you know standardized like here's a pawn here's a bishop whatever and maybe you could get wrapped up in that but the underlying game doesn't change so i would put the the complexity to simple part higher and then I would say that an aesthetic can maybe get in the way of our perceiving that. Right. I might nudge it one way or the other. Yeah. Well, looking at a different perspective, like I think you and I would argue that Rising Sun is not elegant at all. No. But if we had played with a much simpler version of the game that one time we played, we might have slightly less uh, feelings of, you know, it might, it might have seemed slightly less like crazy Ameritrash than it did. Maybe like if you just took away all the visuals, all and the cleaned pe- it up. And you just, if you made yeah. all the pieces like cubes or something, but it, it felt like a lot of the rules were designed to add complexity and add craziness for the you know experience of the game, as opposed to having a deep streamlined game. As maybe it's almost like a width versus depth thing. Like yeah, chess you could is, think of it that way. Go, we think of as being elegant, and they're very deep games, but they're not that broad in the sense of there's only so many moves. Like the rules don't change, the moves are always the same, the objective is always the same, the start is always the same. There's no randomness, but you have an almost infinite number of possible positions and sequences that you are trying to sort through when you're playing. Right, which which leads me kind of to a, another thought about different kinds of games. So, in the modern board gaming world, I think generally the most what would consider the most elegant games would be the abstract strategies. The least elegant games would be war games or Ameritrash games with euros somewhere in the middle. And that's interesting because this next elegant game that I thought of was Twilight Struggle. Well, that's an interesting case. And and the reason I would put war games on one on the other end of the spectrum is that generally and traditionally they try to be more simulationist. So in other words, their their base like fundamental design philosophy is that if there's a decision between elegance and simulating history better, they'll tend to simulate history better. Right. So it's just part of the design philosophy. But a lot of the war games that we enjoy and that we've seen over the last decade they tend to not make that choice quite as often so you see the coin games i mean they're complicated and they have a lot of war game you know they they follow that design philosophy a lot but they also borrow a lot from like euro area control stuff not only just visually but in 
kind of abstracting out a lot of things that other war games would be much more interested in, like the battle systems, which in coin games like tend to be quite simple. It's like this piece is a value of one, this other piece is of you know is a strength of two, and this third one is a strength of four. Yeah. I mean Pendragon's the one we have out on the table right now in the newest one we played, and that probably is the most complicated battle system, but I don't think it's that bad. And you know, even compared to like Blood in the Fog, which is a simpler game, the battle system for resolving is about as complex as Pendragon, I think. Mm-hmm. And from what I understand, that's kind of the the norm historically for for war games is to have these very simulationist, at the very least, battle resolutions. Yeah, if you asked me, like, is this coin game, you know, is Pendragon elegant? I think my first response would be like, no, there's way too much stuff going on. But if you asked me relative to other war games, like maybe, I don't know, other games like that we've we've kind of read about some of these other games that are where you're tracking all sorts of different stuff and there's sure. different rules for every different scenario and all this stuff to simulate the difference between fighting in a forest versus fighting in a swamp with tanks versus infantry and what sort of equipment do you have and all that sort of kind of extra detail to be historically faithful or accurate that takes away from the elegance because you're putting more complexity back in instead of finding a way to reduce it or yeah or, and i and i don't mean reduce in the sense of lesson i mean reduce in the sense of like distill sure right which isn't necessarily a bad thing either because again there's a different end goal there the end goal for many war games is to be a a, a means of looking at history right yeah. it's oh it, absolutely whereas the end goal of a euro game is typically to be a is to be simple <laughs> yeah is to is to be simple yet strategic yeah but let's talk about twilight struggle because that's a very interesting case twilight struggle creates a ton of strategy from a relatively simple rule set you have a hand of cards you go back and forth playing a card and you do one of two things with the cards and you're doing basically. a tug of war over influence and you have some area control yeah. on a map so again the area control thing is just a straightforward back and forth affair that you would see in you know that that you would see in like el grande right similar to that Mm -hmm. but it's also a game that exports a decent chunk of its rules complexity to the cards and that's an interesting case for me because i was thinking like what about magic the gathering it's fairly simple to teach someone magic for the first time the stack i think is a very elegant concept but i think if I remember correctly, like the full rules of magic with all the card errata and the explanations and everything is like 300 pages long. Well, they keep adding keywords and it's sure. a game that's been around for 20 years and they keep adding new stuff. So it's not going to be a one page, five minute explanation. Right. But I mean, it kind of could be like the base rules again are quite simple. Sure. As soon as someone picks up a hand of cards, they're going to have a bunch of questions. Yeah, and I think there's a difference between Twilight Struggle and Magic in that almost everything in Twilight Struggle is manipulating the same, like, three keywords, yeah. to use the same term. Whereas mm-hmm. in Magic, maybe the base set would be closer in that everything was a handful of keywords, and I'm sure there were more than three, but there was a handful of things, and it was the basic mechanic of, you know, attack, defense, power, and tapping things to use them. Mm-hmm. But in Twilight Struggle, I think almost everything boils down to putting influence on or off the board or affecting the other person's ability to put influence on or off the board. Yeah. Or occasionally the space race. Right. Which, again, is... Yeah. Uh, there is more than that. There's a few peripheral things. You know, there's realignment checks, which are manipulating influence, but they're a little bit different. Mm-hmm. There's coups, which are a little bit different. There's the space race, which has a little bit extra. There's, you know your mill ops, which is a little bit different. There's the VPs that you're going back and forth. So there's a little bit more going on there, but I think we both have experienced and expressed the uh, kind of view that we feel like we're playing the Cold War and the tension between these superpowers and it's so well finely tuned and there's so much captured in the game and, and so complex and strategic. There's so many choices and uh, implications of what you're doing and back and forth. And yet on your turn, your choice is just 
what card do I play? Right. And do I play it for this number or do I play it for the text? Yeah, which taps into this idea of, I guess I would call it experiential complexity. Because you can easily math out, again, like the possibility space of Go and chess and compare them and see that they're different. And you could math out the possibility space of any of these games and see that they're different. But games aren't all just going through a list of possible moves. We play games, especially thematic ones, the modern board games are nearly all of them, to also create a rich experience. And that's less easily quantifiable. Like, how do you measure the experience that you feel of playing Twilight Struggle? You, you can't. You can try to describe it, but you can't quantify that. But I think right. you, you I can... would classify Twilight Struggle as an elegant game because it creates a rich experience, even though, I mean, there's a lot of strategy in the game, but there's a fair, fair bit of luck in Twilight Struggle. But the experience itself is so rich and interesting and in and creates emotions and things like that, that I think it creates again a complexity on that level that you wouldn't necessarily get with other games. Sure. And I think it can do that while still having a simple rule set. Right. Another game, you know, one of our other favorite games to talk about, Twilight Imperium, is a very rich experience, but I would not say that it is elegant in any way because there's just, like, so much stuff, like, crashing into each other. Sure. And... You don't have a ton of things to do on your turn, but you there's more choices than in Twilight Struggle. And yeah. there's a lot more randomness. <laughs> Correct. But then let's look at a game like The Resistance, right? Mm-hmm. If you quantified like the decision possibilities in The Resistance, it would actually be quite small. Like Relative to these other games, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Like, if you're playing a five-player game of The Resistance, like there's only... This would be what less than a hundred different setups for like mission setups possible, or it'd be significantly less, right? Depending on the mission size, I suppose. Yeah, and you could propose multiple missions each time. Yeah. So you would get into three digits, but I don't think you'd get much beyond that. Yeah. Without doing which, some math. Compared to Go, which I think the the number of possible decisions over the course of that game is like more than the number of atoms in the universe or something. Some unfathomably huge yeah. number i mean it's what is it 19 squared factorial <laughs> it's, it's something just stupefyingly large so that like 300 and what is it 381 is 300 something is 19 squared so th- maybe maybe 300 something factorial yeah that's yeah it's just, just insane monstrously like beyond comprehensibly huge. yeah but i would argue that the resistance is very very elegant just like go is and it's not because of the possibility space of the decisions that are quantifiable it's again because of the experience of it right Right. because you can't you can't quantify like suspicion and doubt and you know psychological uncertainty or like evaluating that's where the complexity that you're distilling is in that sort of the social dynamics of trying to read another person and figure out which combination of people is safe yeah. to put together. And then voting a, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, yay or nay is your decision. Mm-hmm. But all of the the thinking and deduction and suspicion and suspense that goes into like leading up to those moments is what creates that complexity that allows for it to be an elegant game. Because if it was just like if if it was all randomized, it would not be interesting. At yeah. All. Yeah, and I guess that's a level, I guess experiential complexity is one way to put it. I, you could call it like non-discrete complexity. Right. Maybe. <laughs> right, non-quantitative complexity. Sure. Well, the, now I'm thinking of, and, and, and it's not particularly elegant, but like the most complex game in the world is probably a role-playing game, right? Because then you have the entire, like, some experience of like human human nature and storytelling and all that stuff that like, how do you, you can't quantify that, but there's so many rich and interesting interactions that can come about with a shared storytelling experience. Sure. And isn't the most complex role playing game, the game of life. Yes. Life itself is the ultimate, (laughs) the ultimate complex game. (laughs) I think we've gotten off track. (laughs) Yeah. But it's interesting to look at it from those two 
angles, and, and I think both of them are significant. And then when you, when you jump back to Euro games, you often have a mixture of both. And I think we can also say that when evaluating a game, you could pick out some parts of it that are elegant. Like, this mechanism is elegant, mm-hmm. and this is a mess. Not that it makes it a bad game, but just evaluating it in those sorts of terms, you could find that part of it, part of something, or part of a game to be elegant, yeah. and others not. Yeah, you do that with Twilight Imperium. I think the strategy card system is pretty elegant. Obvi- and, you and, know, and it stole it from a Euro game, so I guess that makes sense. And that's because that board games, by nature, tend to be a combination of systems. Sure. And so we can describe some systems as more elegant than others. Mm-hmm. And then you think, and this wasn't in my notes, but I'm thinking of Lisboa, which is a series of, I think, almost almost universally, I would say, pretty elegant systems, but added up create a very high, at least, entry uh, learning curve into the game when you combine them together. But like each individual part is pretty pretty elegant in that it it takes something simple and it causes a lot of nuance into the game so like the economic track that goes back and forth or the way cubes are pulled from the shared space where the stores are built right when all those when those different sub systems interact with each other as part of the overall game because the, the individual thing of like place a store take off a cube pay some money or like play a card get a token (laughs) those things are all very simple like you were saying but when you have to when you're balancing them all together and then you add in a multiplayer environment Mm -hmm. it becomes much more complicated almost like complexity synergy or something (laughs) right well it it, it's almost an exponential increase right so so if a certain thing you know branches out and has implications for three other things and then one of those things has implications for three things and there's overlap right yeah. complexity builds on itself the next thing i had in my notes is what about games that are precise so the example came to mind of concordia and i wouldn't say concordia off the top of my head i wouldn't say concordia is particularly elegant it's el- you know it's a euro game and as euro games go it's pretty run of the mill in terms of rules complexity to again output complexity or, or possibility or decision space complexity but i think well it's a game that seems like if any part of it was tweaked just a hair it would throw the whole thing out of balance it would throw the whole thing out of whack. Like all the ways in which the different resources indirectly interact with each other creates a system that seems very precisely designed. Do you think that's an aspect of elegance or is that just something different? I think that's probably something different. We think of it in a similar way, but based on how we've been talking about elegance so far, I think that's, it's almost the inverse the the other example of this is like a complex machine that is finely fit together you know like a mm-hmm. fine piece of craftsmanship you know maybe like a you know a fancy watch or something that is very precisely constructed and assembled to do something and in that case the output of it looks very simple because it's a dial going around telling sure. time but the interior of it is much more complex and so it's almost it's like a complicated thing doing a simple thing <laughs> once you put it together. I don't know. Or like I was also thinking like a choreographed dance where you have a bunch of actors coming together and they all have their little part. And if you watched one without everyone else, it might not make sense. But when you put all the different routines and actors and whatever together, you see something larger than each individual bit. That's interesting because it is kind of the inverse, but you would almost also call it elegant. Maybe it's beautiful like a, a, a beautiful, is the beauty beautiful or something. Beautiful yeah. would probably be the better word, but then elegant and beautiful are so closely aligned. That's a strange, strange thing of, of the English language. There are other words. Well, there there's the class of words that have two definitions that are right. opposite of each right. other. Yeah. And this is almost that. Maybe it would depend on the person. Uh, you know, I I've talked about this before, but I don't. I'm not a prescriptivist when it comes to language. So I don't know if I would call that elegant necessarily, but other people might. 
Because there's like there's there's the idea of like design elegance where you hide away complexity, but you know, like the watch, right? You know, you you would call a very you you could call a watch extremely elegant, but maybe you're just looking at the outside visuals of it and calling that elegant, and not necessarily the whole in you know factoring in the complexity of the mechanics. But then you know, from a watchmaker perspective, a particular watch may be very mechanically elegant just because it does something you know, with more elegance relative to other types of watches. And I guess the final idea or thought I had is I at least often think of elegance as a design goal. And we talked a little bit about this with war games before. And I think Euro games, that's kind of one of the fundamental philosophical design goals of the Euro game movement is that you have simple games that have strategy with them because it was originally designed. I say this like it was one person, but the idea of German style board games was that there'd be games that the whole family could play and they'd be interesting for everyone. And then they would, you know, not have a lot of direct player interaction or not a lot of luck and and people would be able to play all the way to to the end. Mm -hmm. Those were kind of the other goals, but I think one of them was a kind of, of elegance, but Nowadays, when you have games that borrow a lot from that European tradition or the German tradition or whatever you want to call it, you have games that do that, but also stack on a lot of chrome and a lot of flavor and a lot of thematic bits and pieces. And I think the designers would say that elegance is a goal, but it's certainly not the only goal. And so I guess modern board game design seems to be almost based around the decision of or a number of decisions of do we make this more or less elegant or more or less simple yeah i think elegance is generally a good thing in games when it's not the only goal because i think if elegance was the only goal you'd end up with a bunch of go clones that were just not as good yeah you'd create a bunch of abstract games because theme necessarily gets in the way right and so if you're trying to put together your heuristic for designing a game or something, you would want as much com- as much elegance without compromising the other things. So you wouldn't want it to be needlessly complex. Right. Because that I, I would expect that to interfere with the experience of people playing the game. But you don't want to avoid making your game interesting or have the theme not fit well or not model a system the way you want purely for the sake of reducing complexity and trying to make it feel or look as elegant as possible maybe if if go had like four types of pieces instead of one it could still be elegant because you're taking a huge possibility space and coming it down to maybe like a medium size instead of a very simple decision point i think we've kind of gotten to this but maybe haven't said it is that you can have a game that is relatively elegant compared to other games in that style or in that family or category or or similar games or something like that or or maybe even elegant compared to how it might have been sure without being elegant on the grand scale of all games that you might consider yeah well and i'm thinking from a designer standpoint i think the process either implicitly or explicitly is you you conceive of an idea, be it a theme or a an experience that you want people to have or a particular type of decision that you want people to have, and you build that up, and then you you remove all the unnecessary parts while still keeping the vision, right? So, so you know, if you were to go about making the ultimate Lord of the Rings game, you know that's not going to be what people would call an elegant game, but like I'm looking at War of the Ring. They could have certainly made that a lot more fiddly and a lot more complex. And I and I wouldn't be surprised if the design process had a lot of complexity that they felt they could strip away before they got to the game they wanted. So maybe the the concept of the great game kind of creates this elegance floor, right? And then once you build up all the bits and pieces that you want to have in the game or all the experiences, you kind of strip away till you hit that floor. Yeah. And that might be kind of the ultimate goal of a given design finding the experience you want and then making that experience as simple as possible like in a philosophical sense i doubt that's the thought process of someone designing a game of like because i'm doing a lord of the rings thematic game it can only be x 
Simple. Oh, sure. And, and again, and it's, it, it's, it's, it's a bunch of non-quantifiable yeah, things. Much more of an iterative process of... We, we've talked to a few de- designers and they've told stories about like, yeah, it used to be like this and then that didn't work. And we, we test played and test played and test played and eventually decided that this whole system just could be thrown out or it could be simplified down to, you know, two possibilities instead of 20 or something. Right. Yeah. I guess, I mean, I, w- I, I imagine most game designers do that without even thinking of it, but that, that's got to be the process for it. Like, the idea has to have a particular elegance floor, and then you find that. So you make the game as elegant as, or ideally you make the, ele- the game as elegant as it can be without losing, without losing the concept of itself. Yeah, and I think we're kind of, I think we might be coming at this at a kind of a funny angle, kind of shoehorning this into a discussion on elegance or maybe it's just a different term but when i think of like a a game we might describe as tight or well designed it's usually one of the the first characteristics would be all the systems work together with themselves and there's nothing there there aren't things that are super out of place Mm -hmm. or ill balanced or in that all, all the different parts of the game go together and work together and serve each other to make a better experience than if they were more haphazardly thrown together. Yeah. Well, it kind of goes back. Isn't it an engineering thing that you, when you're designing something, or maybe it's just generally design is that you just, you build what you want to make and then you just strip away all the unnecessary parts. Someone famous maybe. said that, I think. I don't know. Mark Davis, 2018. <laughs> The only other thought I was going to say is that as you were kind of describing this process of like piling stuff up and then shipping away, I, I don't know how true this is, but the, uh, the the old adage of like how Michelangelo would carve his paintings and he'd start with just a block of marble and he'd be like, yeah, it's the, the, take away the, statues, all the, th- the statues inside. I'm just like getting it out and carving away everything that's not part of it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And it's, a, it's an interesting way of, of looking at things because sometimes we kind of start with basic building blocks of ba- basic concepts and we try to put something together but we've been kind of talking more about having a a big pile of stuff or a big you know mess of systems and cubes and dice and whatever else and then simplifying the system or chopping off that or pruning this or yeah. whatever to get down to a more elegant well-designed game yeah well it's the same thing with writing also right you have editing there where mm-hmm. You know, you, you try to write out what your idea is and then you find ways to make it more succinct and more straightforward. And I always, when I was growing up, I kind of rejected that idea, like in, in high school. And I'm like, well, you know, sometimes you need to write more and sometimes the language itself is beautiful. Looking at it now, I don't think those concepts are at odds because you look at some great writers who may be known for being more verbose or flowery or, you know, they, they go on. And you can still make an argument that they're giving you the experience and they're using the words very succinctly just in their own way. Sometimes you just need more words. So, like, a game, and that reminds me of a game like Twilight Imperium, like, Part of the essence and the in the idea of that game is that it's big and long and has lots of pieces, and that's a game edited down. Yeah, still, and, and all of those things work together to make Twilight Imperium a very good game. Right, and if you kind of tilt your head one way, you might say, "Oh, that makes it elegant because everything is working together mm-hmm. to make this game." But when you kind of like look the other way, you're like. There's so much stuff. How could this ever be elegant? Yeah, I'm not saying it's elegant. I'm saying that it's not necessarily... If something's big and has lots of bits and lots of systems and stuff, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's haphazardly created. Sure, because it it could be more elegant than it was at one point. And probably almost every published game is more elegant in the finished state than it was Halfway through the process. Yeah, that's why you paid developers right. <laughs> to hone in the game. The last thing I wanted to talk about was just a list of elegant mechanisms I, I thought of. And when I was thinking of like, okay, what are some really elegant mechanisms? It ended up being very similar to my list of my favorite mechanisms, which I guess makes sense. 
this goes back to your comment the other day of like if a movie's interesting to me it's good <laughs> yeah that's that's a whole another discussion <laughs> and matt needs to be here for that one <laughs> so we'll get we'll get at it <laughs> but it was hard to think of mechanisms that I don't necessarily love, but I think are elegant. But let's start with the the obvious one, the Dominion victory point cards is, I think, both incredible and I love that as a piece of design. And it's kind of the epitome of excellence because it solves the problem of how do you ultimately get points in this game and also how do you make the game tense and exciting until the end and how do you incorporate a catch-up mechanism all of that accomplished with just the fact that the cards do nothing other than give you points that clog up your deck. So with that out of the way, I speculated that rule zero in D&D, or in RPG systems generally, is elegant in its own way, which is rule zero is traditionally that whatever the DM says goes. It's like a, the veto power over all the other rules. Right. <laughs> because it, 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 it captures and creates the game in a sense like i mean role-playing it, games are of, about it's a, that it's a way of solving any dispute or question or whatever of you know whatever you might think or whatever argument you want to try to propose or like try to finagle some character you know whatever the dm has the ultimate say and just be like no it doesn't work like that yeah or yes this works like this you yeah know? or you know like some dms have the the rule of cool or something where it's like if it's suitably awesome, they let it happen, even if it's not strictly yeah, valid yeah. within the rules. Yeah, and that's that's what I think really neat. In, in otherwise, what would be a very complicated game, you have this this one rule that says, okay, the experience is king, and this rule makes that happen. Yeah. Going back to mechanisms I've mentioned before, the speed bumps in suburbia, uh, which are, are kind of just a really perfect catch up mechanism and, and make the game interesting in a lot of different ways. The market mechanism and power grid is really well done. And again, I'm repeating myself from earlier podcasts, but why don't more games do that? <laughs> I like, don't know. I was just reading... Uh, Archipelago has something f somewhat similar, but it's more complex, right? Yeah. There's more goods and there's multiple markets, but yeah. And it's harder to use the market. Yeah. You have to like take a special action and then you can buy or sell one thing. <laughs> on right, right. Yeah. I, w I was just reading last night about efficient market theory, and I think the first guy that kind of put that out there, maybe like mid uh, 20th century, is that like Chicago guys? Like, I think so. Market equilibrium? Maybe. Okay. I think the, the, the point was that the market is relatively efficient, and you're not going to beat it most of the time. <laughs> Because oh, in terms of investing? I think so, yeah. Okay, I think that was an offshoot of Chicago theories from that era. It's uh, it's just the yeah. idea of like, and there, there's different tiers and applications and whatever. Uh, it, was, it was just this idea of like, the information you know about the market is already incorporated into the price. So you don't actually have an edge. And the market, if, if there is an imbalance, the market will adjust to compensate for it. Right. And investing is all about finding that before the market adjusts, right? So it becomes a thing of can you find do you ha can you find an edge, or can of, you predict? Can, well, yeah. right? Can you predict one, which is like the whole point of this book I'm reading of predictions? Well, and, and predict faster than the aggregate other investors out there, right? Yeah. So can you know can you make better predictions, and can you find information before? enough other people get it that the market adjusts. Yeah. Which is not really the point of the market and power grid, just that markets are a interesting system. And well, they're they... incredibly elegant. Yeah. Prices. True. That's the, that's the most elegant system is, <laughs> is prices. Yeah. Because it communicates information that you could not otherwise communicate. And you couldn't even list all the stuff that it's communicating. Oh, yeah. There's like all this interaction and feedback and all sorts of stuff that goes into a price but you you like bring all of that stuff down to this is the value of this at this time right or the accepted value <laughs> the value in one sense like the value in aggregate like the value the market value right the, yeah the the price the market's willing to bear or yeah sure right anyways yeah power grid does that does a good simulation of that very elegantly 
Uh, we already talked about Carcassonne, the fact that you only decide with one tile. I know some people play a variant where they choose from two or three tiles. I haven't tried that, but I suspect that it's probably probably doesn't make the game that much better and just creates more downtime. Is it that you draw two and choose one to play, or you have a hand? And I you think like you replace? just have a rotating hand of three. Okay. I mean, maybe I, you could do it either. The way. idea with that is that it lets you plan ahead a little more and have like some combos of yeah. like this and then this and then this. But it is less elegant than the base right. way of draw one, play one. That's an interesting case because it it makes the game more complex, like the strategy more complex. But I think probably not great enough to justify the the entry complexity into figuring that out yeah because it, it, it hurts it, the experience with it downtime might end and up being that. more fun but it might also be less elegant <laughs> sure yeah which is interesting here's one i don't think i've mentioned before which is a bit of almost design elegance or like visual elegance is the battle strength of the three different types of units in memoir 44 So you have the infantry, which does three damage at one distance, and then two at two distance, and one at one distance. Mm -hmm. So you just count three, two, one from the hex where it's at. The tanks just go three, three, three. They always hit three at three distance. Mm -hmm. And then the artillery is three, three, two, two, one, one. And it's so easy to remember and so easy to visualize and so easy to count out that just from a almost a graphic design standpoint that I think that's incredibly elegant. And if I remember right, all the terrain penalties are calculated into the number of dice you roll. So if it, it's, yes. like, it's like three, two, minus one for forest, yeah. so you roll yeah. one dice. Exactly. And then the final one in a game that I don't love, I think it's pretty good, but I, I don't love it. But there's a bit of elegance in quantum that is... I'm amazed that I don't think anyone thought of it beforehand where your ship are dice and their attack strength and their speed are just inverted powers. So a one can move one space, but it also hits more easily. Right, because you hit on low numbers. You hit on low numbers, yep. yeah. A two moves two and hits on a two or a one. Mm-hmm. Or, or, sorry, on a everything but a one. I think I don't remember how they. No, you you both roll dice and you're. Oh, that's right. You total. compare the difference. Right. So like yeah. a two versus a five, you have it's essentially like a plus three modifier on your dice roll. Yeah. Or yeah. a minus three modifier on your dice. Sure. Roll. But, yeah. yeah. But just having just that perfect inverse correlation mm-hmm. between those two significant values, and then you just use dice, so it's very easily displayed. I think is really nicely done. Yeah. That's an that's an elegant concept. I'm surprised you haven't brought up dominant species. That's See, dominant a game species love to talk about about the design of that game. Yeah, but it's it's hard to pin down. It's just like every little thing about it. But I can't point to one aspect and say that's super crazy elegant. It's it's the whole. I think if I were to choose one, it would be the kind of the perpendicular axes of dominance versus population. Sure. Right? Yeah. 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 And if you, but then but then to explain why that's elegant and interesting, you have to understand like all bunch of other parts of the game sure. and why those are important. Sure. Yeah, relative to each other. I, I would say that that concept of delinking population num- size, f- yeah, numbers. Yeah, numbers from adaptability or dominance gives you a lot of room to do interesting things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good one. And uh, Probably the other best example of that kind of like cross-axis system would be uh, some of the coin games, especially Fire in the Lake, where you have the like the support and the control, which mm-hmm. are not related, and they each let you do different actions, and they're affected by different actions. And one faction cares about one thing, one axis, and the other factions care about the other axis. But right. you have to kind of interact with each other, and you're struggling in these different ways. Yeah, and in that one it's interesting because there's there are intermediary things that affect both. Yeah, I thought most things tend to be on one axis or the other. Most of them, most I th- think well, there are a couple most that things that are affect sometimes both. limited by your position on this axis, but affect the other axis. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good example. Any other examples you can think of? I don't know. Those are the main ones. Yeah, those uh, those I think are good examples. Downforce. 
See, I don't think Downforce is that elegant. Because it's not that complicated. It's not co- that complicated. It's just a good time. Yeah. It is very streamlined. It's simple. Easy to understand, and the, well, the, the play very much serves the type of game it's trying to be. But that's a case where it's simple and a good design, but not necessarily elegant because there's not a ton of complexity that's being reduced. Yeah, there's not a lot of strategy. I mean, there's some, but there's not a whole lot of strategy in that game. The strategy is just be in front of other people at the curves <laughs> or right. at the choke yeah. points. Yeah. Don't get stuck at a choke point. <laughs> so there's an example where uh, a game's just simple. It's it's not simple and elegant. I, 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 sh- I should mention Ticket to Ride. The, the, the choice between choosing a card drawing or, cards or drawing or a playing card or playing cards. cards on your turn is really a really elegant decision point in that game. What about 4X? 4X is a weird one <laughs> because... It's talking about the most complicated system, the market. I mean, yeah, kind of, but... <laughs> Not really. I don't know. I, I think I have to understand that game more We'd before have I have any kind of evaluation on this more to axis. Even yeah, understand it. Like we can barely talk about that game. <laughs> well, an example of kind of an opposite of an elegant game might be Vast. That has a ton of rules for fairly simple set of systems, just because they have to all interact with each other in in different configurations. Yeah, and I, I think. There's a s- distinction, and I'm not sure how to what to call it, but we've talked about elegance as as generally being a complex thing simplified or mm-hmm. brought down to a, a smaller decision tree that has lots of outcomes and lots of strategy and lots of possibilities. And then in game design, we've talked about systems that are elegant because they do a lot of things with a simple uh, a, a simple thing you know so like the dominion uh, victory point uh, mm-hmm. it solves a lot of problems and adds a lot of strategy with that that piece that victory cards go in your deck sure don't do anything but i think there's kind of a, a similar term of synchronized or integrated or streamlined or something like that of that is maybe a little more synonymous with good design i think it overlaps with elegance sometimes in the sense that of not having more than you need and not having extra bits or having all everything works together. But I think that is maybe subtle, but it's a different concept than what we think. I don't know if that's that. different. I think it's just relative elegance. Okay. Right? So if something is simplified and streamlined, it's become more elegant. Even if we ultimately might not say the game is particularly elegant. Maybe. I don't know. Betrayal, there's a there's an unelegant game. <laughs> There's a giant rule set for not much complexity. <laughs> yeah, boy. That might be the that might be the uh, the flag bearer for in is it, it's inelegance, inelegance? Right? inelegance, not unelegance. Um, along with our <laughs> favorite game to rag on, Rising Sun. <laughs> <laughs> I, f- I feel more comfortable ragging on Betrayal because I've only played Rising Sun once. Yeah, we've played Betrayal what twenty times or something. Probably close to that. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's all I had to say on elegance. Any any other thoughts you had? I think we've said too much to make this an elegant podcast. Yeah, no, it's it's gone on. I, have we ever had an elegant podcast? Probably not. Probably not. Can you? Maybe, but not this one. That's our podcast for today. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com to see all kinds of good stuff there. Check me out on social media. And if you would like to contribute and help out, with this podcast doing its thing, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. And don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. We're now on Spotify. Ooh. That's a new thing. Nice. I guess Spotify does podcasts now, and I had to click a couple buttons and then I was on it. There, so you, there go. you go. On Spotify. Elegance. You clicked a couple buttons, and now your yeah. podcast is available to millions of people on the internet. I mean, it was before. It's just on a new platform <laughs> but the, but podbean made it very simple to do that so there you go that that was elegant i suppose thanks for listening everybody we'll talk to you again soon we'll be back next week with another main podcast because we got off sync with our schedule a bit so podcast number 35 will be in exactly one week instead of two weeks bye everyone peace out <laughs>